Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on behalf of the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies here at the ANU. My name is John Minns, I'm the director of ANCLIS, and on behalf of ANCLIS and the Embassy of Argentina, I'd like to welcome you here to this, the latest in our series of public lectures, uh, this time on the question of the Malvinas. The uh, ANCLIS, the centre which I, which I direct here at the ANU, has presented many, many issues related to Latin America. Uh, concerts, cultural issues, political issues, issues of economics and politics. Uh, some have been non-controversial and some have been very controversial. And we don't shy away from the controversial ones, uh, but what we want to do is to present uh, an idea of what the controversies are in a, in a scholarly way and have a polite discussion to follow. And that's what we'll do tonight. The uh, centre that we run here at, at, uh, at the ANU is involved in many, many things and at the end of the lecture tonight I'll advertise a couple of events to come in the weeks to come. But if you're not in contact with the centre and you happen to hear about this particular public lecture by chance or whatever, and you want to stay in touch with us regularly and to find out what we do almost every week now, then please put your name on the email list and you'll join that growing number of people in Canberra and beyond who are constantly informed about Latin American affairs in Canberra. I have the great pleasure tonight to present our speaker, uh, His Excellency Mr. Pedro, Pedro Viagra Delgado. He is, of course, the ambassador of Argentina to Australia, also the dean of the group of Latin American missions in Australia, and indeed he is the dean of the diplomatic corps in Australia. He comes to us with not only a distinguished diplomatic background, but an extensive academic experience as well. He graduated with honours as a lawyer from Universidad Nacional de Tucumán. He obtained his master's in laws in public international law at King's College, University of London and graduated with honours from the Argentine Foreign Service Institute. From 1980 to 1988, he served as the permanent, at the permanent mission of Argentina to the United Nations, and from 1992 to 96 as Consul General in London. At the Foreign Ministry in Buenos Aires, he served at the Legal Advisors <coughs> Office as Head of the Division for International Security, Nuclear and Space Affairs from 1996 to 2001, and then as Chief of Cabinet of the Foreign Minister. He was coordinator for strategic projects from 2002 to 2005. Since then, he's been the ambassador to Australia and non-resident ambassador to Fiji. He teaches public international law at the University of Buenos Aires and has lectured and published on matters related to international security, non-proliferation, disarmament, democracy and human rights. Might I also say that he's been a great supporter of Latin American studies in Australia and particularly of ANCLIS at this university. Would you please welcome His Excellency Mr. Pedro Viagra Delgado. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you all of you for being here. And of course, besides with my different hats that I have uh, in Australia at this moment, this question of deanship, today, of course, I will speak only as ambassador of Argentina. Uh, the purpose of the talk is to give an outlook of the question of the Malvinas Islands, of the history, and that of the territorial sovereignty dispute existing between Argentina and the United Kingdom over those and other islands in the South Atlantic. The treatment of this dispute at the United Nations and other international fora, and where a number of pronouncements of the matter, on the matter have been um, adopted, and also the, eventually the future perspectives of the of the dispute. My intention is to follow afterwards with a, a question and answers uh, if we have the time. The age of the so-called discovery voyages initiated by the arrival of, of Spain to the Americas and the Portuguese to India led to the need to develop rules of international law to regulate this process of acquisition of territories between these colonial powers. The rules applicable to the acquisition of colonial territories varied together with the developments of technology, navigation, communications, and information in general. Thus, the beginning title could be based only on deeds such as the papal bulls by which the Pope gave rights, quote unquote, to Spain and Portugal at the end of the 15th century, practically dividing the world into two. As it happened with colonial powers, what the peoples being divided thought about it was not a consideration. However, other European major players started from day one of these discoveries trying to get a foothold on the new known lands irrespective of what the papal bull said. 
At the beginning, the rules would accept that all lands discovered be occupied or not in the spaces comprised within the papal grant would belong to either Spain and Portugal. With time, and as exploration advanced and other actors also ventured into the new geographical spaces, the prevailing law demanded further requirements in order for a territory to be acquired. Thus, during the 16th century, discovery was necessary, even though it was not followed by occupation. Then, during the 17th century, occupation was required, albeit it could be just through a notional exercise of jurisdiction. And during the 18th century, with most of the world already mapped and known, and vessels plying the waters of all oceans, effective occupation was needed to claim a territory. These rules also varied through time, depending on the characteristics of the territory in question. The closer to the centers of power, the more stringent the rules for acquiring territory became. Thus, already by the end of the 16th century, in the already known areas of the Americas, the well-known areas, mere discovery was not sufficient if it were not to follow by occupation. Instead, in more isolated and inaccessible places, occupation took longer to become a requisite for acquisition of territory. The Malvinas was first spotted by members of the expedition of Hernando de Magalhães in 1520, sailing for the Spanish king. They were included in several maps from that date to 1561, about six or seven maps. They were sailed by Simón de Alcazaba in 1534 and Alonso de Camargo in 1540. There is no record of actually anybody sit, setting foot on the islands in the 16th century. The islands remained thus by virtue of the right of discovery of the time and by their geographical location within the realm of the Spanish possessions in the Americas. However, Britain claimed that they were the first spotted by John Davis in 1592. That will make psychics of all the captains and cartographers from Spain that actually included the islands in their maps decades before that year. These amazing Spaniards and navigators sailing from Spain had powers to see and charter those islands before they were seen for the first time by English eyes. Besides, his supposed sighting did not lead to the islands being included in any English cartography. A curious oversight indeed. In fact, after the Spaniards, the only recorded site was only that of the Dutch navigator, Seval de Vert. The first settlement in Malvinas was established by the French in Soledad Island <clears throat> in 1764, I was named Port Louis. As the French expedition proceeded, proceeded from, the Brit from Brittany, from Saint-Malo, they called the, the islands Malouine, and from that derived the Spanish name Malvinas. The French establishment led to protests from Spain, and France recognized that the territory belonged to the Spanish crown and returned the settlement in 1766 upon the payment of the cost incurred by the French in their establishment. From that date, Spain had a governor at Puerto Soledad, as Paul Louis was named after the transfer, until they withdrew altogether from the Viceroyalty of the River Plate as a consequence of the independence process of the colonies. The last Spanish government le the governor left Malvinas in 1811. The new revolutionary government in Buenos Aires took upon paying the salaries owned to the offices of this, in this settlement. From 1820 onwards, Buenos Aires appointed its own authorities in the islands. Governors Jewett, Areguati, Vernet, Mestivier, and Pinedo. Britain, for its part, through a clandestine expedition creating a small settlement in one of the smaller outer islands of the archipelago, Sounders, Isla Trinidad, off to the west of Gran Malvinas in 1766. If we have a map, it's, uh, you will see it. Um, no. No, okay. Doesn't matter. It's uh, one of the outer islands in the, in the west, northwest of the islands. And the, this small settlement was called Port Egmont. This base could not be called anything other than clandestine, and despite the secrecy of the government of Britain in this operation, Spain became aware of it and repeatedly protested invoking its rights. As no acceptable response was received, the then governor of Buenos Aires, Jose Bucarelli, from whose jurisdiction Malvinas depended, <coughs> expelled the British settlement by force in 1770. To avoid a possible military conflict with Great Britain, a bilateral agreement was signed in 1771, by which the British settlement was returned to Spain, by Spain, sorry, to, to, to save the honor of the English king, but making express reservation of sovereignty over the whole of the archipelago and in an acceptance of the declaration in which Great Britain remained silent as to the reservation of Spanish rights, stating that the islands belong rightfully to her. As part of the agreement, it was verbally accorded that the English would afterwards peacefully vacate the settlements and thus Britain abandoned Port Egmont in 1774, never to return. 
From then on, the Spanish authorities in Puerto Soledad continued to exercise the, their jurisdiction and control over the whole of the archipelago undisturbed. Argentina, together with several of the other colonies of Spain, initiated the struggle for independence in 1810 succeeding the metropolis in the respective territories. The criteria for territorial succession in the Americas for the newly independent republics, as it was to be the case later in the decolonization process in Africa and in parts of Asia a century and a half later, was the uti possidetis iuris. That means that the territory of the new independent nations emerging from the decolonization was the same as that of the preceding colonial entity from which they emerged. In the case of the Americas, the territories of the new republics were those included in the previous colonial Spanish divisions. For Argentina, it was the Viceroyalty of the River Plate, and within it, the territory of the Intendencias which formed it as the Viceroyalty was later, after independence, was divided between the new nations of Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Uruguay. As within the Viceroyalty of the River Plate, Malvinas depended from Buenos Aires, after independence, 1816, they continued to form part of the territory of Buenos Aires, and it was their authorities which instructed Colonel Jewett in 1820 to resume control of Malvinas, establishing his garrison in Puerto Soledad. This act of jurisdiction from the newly independent United Provinces of South America, continuing the uninterrupted sovereignty of Spain since the 16th century and with full effective occupation since 1766, was published in the Salem Gazette in Massachusetts as most of the vessels calling on Malvinas were uh, whalers and the Times of London on the 3rd of August, 1821. Argentine jurisdiction was exercised fully when Britain recognized its independence in 1823 and also when it signed the Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation in 1825. In both cases, without questioning the exercise of, over the Malvinas nor any other part of the rest of the territory inherited by Spain, from Spain. In 1829, the post of political and military governor of Malvinas was created, and Luis Vernet, who took up his command in Puerto Soledad in the same year, appointed for it, was appointed for it. It was at that time the documents from the same foreign office and the Almiralty indicating the convenience in, of establishing a base in the islands, in the small settlement of Port Edmund that had been abandoned almost 60 years before. As Puerto Soledad had been attacked in 1831 by a U.S. Navy ship because of a dispute over sealing uh, vessels flying the U.S. flag, its Argentine garrison was reduced and its facilities weakened. Britain took advantage of the situation and on 3rd January 1833, in a wanton act of aggression, took Puerto Soledad through her frigate Cleo and evicted the members of the Argentine garrison and their families, who were deported to Montevideo. Since then, Force is still the cornerstone of Britain's presence in the archipelago. It was an imperialistic act consistent with the expansionist intent of the British crown. Argentina never consented to this expulsion, and upon knowing of the attack and the taking of the islands by force, the government of Buenos Aires, in charge of foreign affairs of the then Argentine Confederation, protested to Britain for the act of force carried out in peacetime without prior communication or declaration by a friendly government, and those protests continued ever since. In 1833, the then Empire of Brazil also protested the invasion and taking over of the islands by Britain from Argentina. It was the first act of Latin American solidarity in this dispute, which has continued unabated two centuries later and is indeed growing stronger, something of which we Argentines are thankful and proud. We can therefore trace the existence of the sovereignty dispute over the Malvinas to the act of aggression of 1833 by Great Britain, then the most powerful maritime power on earth, against a newly independent nation. However, Argentina did not let the grab pass and notice and has kept its protest over these legitimate rights of sovereignty over the islands and will continue to do so until they are finally returned to us. Britain started settling the islands some years after the colonial grab. That is much later than when the territorial dispute between the two countries already existed. Since 1833, Britain never allowed the Argentine population to return to the islands, nor Argentines in general, to participate in the settlements there. This was and is, 179th year later, a policy clearly designed to block the return of the island, to the islands of its legitimate owners to, and to devolve the islands to the legitimate sovereign, the Argentine people, and for constructing the myth of a peaceful and undisturbed population settling there for generations. From the moment of the occupation in 1833 to the start of the decolonization process at the United Nations, innumerable protests by successive Argentine government was lodged to Britain. 
That's stopping what in international law will be called peaceful occupation in the sense of it not being contested by another power. This is in contrast with the abandonment of the whatever right Britain could have claimed to the outer island of the archipelago where they briefly held the settlement of Fort Egmont between 1766 and 1774. In that case of 59 years, there was an absence from that island, both physically and in claims. Even British documents of the time questioned the right to be there. Given the lack of response by Britain to our protest, Argentina offered to put the matter to arbitration in 1884, which was also rejected. But this colonial act of force should also be considered within the broader picture of the expansion of the British colonial empire, extending from the second half of the 18th century practically until the Second World War. And Argentina, or the Spanish territories, which then became Argentina, were not immune for this thirst for colonies that animated Great Britain exploits in those centuries. Malvinas was not the only attempt of Britain against Argentine territory. It tried to take Buenos Aires from Spain, both in 1806 and 1807, actually briefly taking the city on the first invasion, only to be fought back by the people and local militias, more than by the Spanish troops stationed there, it must be said, and being defeated on both occasions and having to leave. The first attack took place immediately after the taking of the Dutch colony of the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. On the second occasion, they first took Montevideo, and from there an army of 8,000 troops disembarked close to Buenos Aires and attacked the city, but were repelled and surrendered for the second time in two years. After losing the American colonies to the US independence in 1776, a process to acquire new ones around the world started to gain track, and to that end, Britain looked for new bases in the southern seas even when that was forbidden as a result of several treaties which bound it to Spain, including that of North Sound or St. Lawrence Convention of 1790, which granted Britain freedom of navigation in the Pacific on certain conditions, including that they would not make future settlements in territories or islands already occupied by Spain. These processes explain the attacks of Buenos Aires in 1806-1807, the taking of the colony of Cape of Good Hope in southern tip of Africa in 1806, that of St. Helena in 1815, of Tristan da Cunha in 1816, and later Malvinas in 1833. It was part of the imperialist scheme of creating bases from where to expand the empire and colonialism all over the world. After the attack on Malvinas in 1833, they again attacked Argentina in 1845, blockading Buenos Aires and the other ports of the Confederation until 1850. Argentina's protest to this unlawful occupation of Malvinas continued during the whole of the half of the 20th century. The creation of the United Nations brought a new chapter to the dispute, as the charter included a chapter on non-autonomous territories and the trusteeship system. In order to prevent this application to the territories with Argentina claim, a reservation was included in the rapporteur's report of the, uh, in San Francisco in the conference that actually adopted the, the UN Charter saying that the territories included in the list of the non-autonomous territories could not uh, comprise uh, territories which belong to another country, in this case, Argentina. In the meantime, the pressure of people subjected to colonial domination and foreign occupation was boiling up and the call for freedom grew stronger. One of the greatest chapters in the history of the UN has been written, albeit with the blood of those peoples in, in different parts of the world struggling for their freedom from the shackles of colonialism. This process led to the United Nations General Assembly adopting on December 1960, Resolution 1514, on the declaration of the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples, which proclaimed the necessity of bringing to a speedy and unconditional end colonialism in all its forms and manifestations, enshrining two fundamental principles which were to guide the decolonization process, self-determination and territorial integrity. This resolution, which can be considered the Freedom Charter for people subjected to colonial domination and to those which suffer from territorial amputations due to colonial situations affected their territorial integrity, such as the case of Argentina with Malvinas, stated in its operative paragraph six that any attempt, and I quote, any attempt aimed at the partial or total disruption of the national unity and territorial integrity of a country is incompatible with the purpose and principles of the UN Charter. The object of this paragraph was precisely to avoid that the right of self-determination could be used against the territorial integrity of a country. In the case of Malvinas, the invocation by the United Kingdom of that right to be claimed by their own implanted population in the territory after the dispute over their sovereignty already existed 
we have just that effect this resolution wants to avoid. By the way, the United Kingdom did not support the right of self-determination consecrated by Resolution 1514. Such was its commitment to this right. Self-determination is a right dear to Argentina and to all nations in the Americas. We are second to none in defending it. We all, from north to south, became independent nations exercising this right. Through the decolonization process at the UN, it acquired universal status and it was invested in all people subject to colonial domination and foreign occupation. To claim it on behalf of a group who were not only not the subject of any colonial domination, but quite the contrary, the instrument of it, through the establishment of a colony in territories plundered from a young independent nation by an act of force, is to turn this right onto its head. The Malvinas Islands are in a different situation from that of the classical colonial case in which an indigenous population is subjected to colonial domination. They belong de facto on the Uri to Argentina in 1833 and were governed by Argentine authorities and occupied by Argentine settlers. These authorities and these settlers were evicted by violence and not allowed to remain in the territory. On the contrary, they were replaced during this 179 years of usurpation by a colonial administration and population of British origin, no different from the people of the metropolis. These colonies pride themselves on their Britishness. They are British citizens and we respect them. But that is the best proof that they do not constitute a people subjugated by a colonial power. Unfortunately, they are an instrument of a colonial project which violates Argentina's territorial integrity by illegally occupying part of our territory. In Malvinas, there is a colonial situation, but there are no colonized people. It would indeed be an ill application of the right of self-determination were it to be granted to allow for a part of a territory of independent state to be wrested against the will of the inhabitants by an act of force by a third state, such as in this case. This is aggravated by the fact that the existing Argentine population was ousted by this act of force and Argentine nations were never allowed to return or to settle in the islands as we were already and still are preventing in a discriminatory and systematic manner from settling in the archipelagos or owning land. To accept that such a foreign occupation implanted by the occupier will acquire that right just by the mere lapse of time will set an ominous precedent to validate actions of any power <coughs> occupying foreign territories and replacing the people by their own nationals. By claiming that self-determination must apply in this case, Britain is in fact claiming it for itself as a way to legitimize the grab of the islands perpetrated in 1833. In 1964, Argentina made a presentation on its right to the Malvinas, South Georgia, and South, South Sandwich to the subcommittee on the special committee on decolonization, created as a result of Resolution 1514. This led to the adoption of the United Nations General Assembly of Resolution 2065, in 1965, in which it noted the existence of a dispute between Argentina and the United Kingdom concerning sovereignty over the islands, and invited parties to proceed without delay to negotiations recommended by the special committee with a view to finding a peaceful solution to the problem bearing in mind the provisions and objectives of the UN Charter and of Resolution 1514 and the interests of the population of the islands. That means that this is a bilateral dispute between Argentina and the United Kingdom, and that the interests of the islands, no other wishes, must be taken into account, thus excluding the application, in this case, of the right of self-determination. From this resolution onwards, an incipient process of talks between both countries started from 1966, in which the UK indicated its readiness to negotiate without imposing preconditions, and that led to the start of formal talks during 1967, with a view of improving communication between the islands and the Argentine mainland. The object was to arrive to a future agreement on sovereignty. An MOU was agreed in 1968 at the stage of the common objectives to settle definitively and in an amicable manner the dispute of a sovereignty, taking duly into account the interests of the population of the islands and that the two governments intend to make early progress with practical measures to promote freedom of communication and movement between the mainland and the islands. Due to procrastination from the British side, it took three years to conclude a communications agreement which was signed in 1971. Through it, Argentina agreed to provide not only air and maritime links with the continent, but also fuel, teachers of the Spanish, people could move back and forth between Malvinas and the continent without passports, medical and educational service were provided free of charge for the islanders in mainland Argentina, and cooperation on postal communication, farming, and technology were implemented. However, Britain continued to procrastinate in the negotiation held between 1971 and 73, which led Argentina to go again to the UN General Assembly. 
and Resolution 3160 was adopted, which expresses grave concern at the fact that HESF had elapsed since Resolution 2065 without any substantial progress being made in the negotiations, as well as that the way to put an end to this colonial situation was the peaceful solution of the sovereignty dispute between both countries. It also expresses thanks to efforts made by Argentina to facilitate the decolonization process and to promote the well-being of the islanders. It called on both parties to accelerate the negotiation. This resolution was again unheeded by Britain. In 1976, <clears throat> a number of unilateral actions of Britain in disputed area led to a new resolution, 3149, to be adopted at the General Assembly, in which the continued efforts of Argentina will recognize and urge both parties to refrain from taking decisions that will imply introducing unilateral modifications in the situation while the islands are going through a process recommended by Resolution 2066 and 3160. No progress was achieved in the negotiations in the following years, even though Argentina made a number of constructive proposals on a range of issues, including one in early 1982 on the establishment of a permanent negotiation commission that would meet every month for a year in order to solve the sovereignty dispute. Again, it received no answer from Britain. The unfortunate conflict in the South Atlantic of 1982, perpetrated by the most terrible dictatorship that my country experienced, and of which Argentines were victims, has been used by the UK to continue its negative to abide by the UN and many other international organizations' calls to peacefully settle this dispute. That conflict did not alter the nature of the sovereignty dispute, which continues pending the ne of negotiation and resolution. The adoption of Resolution 37.9 by the General Assembly on that very year of 1982 after the conflict by the is a clear reminder to the international community that war does not change the rights of international disputes accepted by the UN. The fact that a war took place and that Britain prevailed did not improve her legal position with regard to the dispute. After the war, Britain pretended that the sovereignty dispute had ceased to exist, as if international law would abide the change of legal status of a territory by a military victory, thus legalizing the use of force as a means of settling territorial disputes. Such a claim would jeopardize the whole system created by the UN Charter the obligation of peaceful settlement of disputes, and indeed the prohibition of the use of force or the threat thereof. We will be back in pre-1914 times. Resolution 37.9, as well as the six others that follow in the General Assembly, until 1988, 38.12, 39.6, 40.21, 41.40, 42.19, 43.25, urge both parties to resume negotiations in order to find as soon as possible a peaceful solution to the sovereign dispute. In fact, when the United Kingdom tried to include a mention to the right of self-determination in what became Resolution 4021 in 1985, the General Assembly rejected by an overwhelming majority. This is a clear mandate given by the international community. Even Security Council Resolution 502 adopted the beginning of the conflict in the South Atlantic and proposed by Britain to the Security Council mandates both parties to find a diplomatic solution to their differences and to respect the purposes and principles of the Charter. In 1983, Argentina recovered its democratic rule, and yet the United Kingdom has persisted in refusing to negotiate with the democratic governments for 30 more years. The Decolonization Committee of the UN has year to year adopted resolutions declaring that the way to put an end to the special and particular colonial situation of the Malvinas is through the peaceful and negotiated solution of the sovereign dispute that exists between Argentina and the United Kingdom. There are 29 of these resolutions that are waiting for Britain to hit them. Argentina is not contrary to cooperation with the UK on practical aspects arising from the de facto situation in the South Atlantic provided they are under due legal safeguards and for the purpose of creating a suitable framework for both parties to resume negotiations urged by the international community. During the 1990s, Argentina again tried to look for ways to reestablish talks of the dispute with Britain, and a number of provisional understandings were reached in this spirit with regard to joint oil exploration, communications, fisheries, which only led to new disappointments. And the UK did not abide by the letter or the spirit of these agreements, using them only as a way to further advance unilaterally their grip on the islands and their resources. In fact, the UK has advanced in unilaterally exploiting the islands and the sea's resources. It is contrary to international law that a country party to a sovereign dispute recognized as such by the UN, we will unilaterally exploit non-renewable resources of the territory in the dispute. 
It is also a direct violation of the already mentioned UN General Assembly Resolution 3149 against introducing unilateral innovations in the area while the dispute is subject to a resolution process. It is not difficult to see the risk that such actions in the South Atlantic could have for disputes elsewhere. And it is particularly troubling that this conduct comes from a permanent member of the Security Council. In cases of a territorial dispute, exploitation of the natural resources is only valid when there is a natural, uh, there is an agreement between the parties to that dispute. In this case, Argentina and the UK. Unilateral exploitation of non-renewable resources in territory subject to a sovereign dispute deplete them in a way that does not allow to return to the status quo ante once the dispute is settled, modifying the situation to the detriment of the country not participating in the activities. The need to put an end to this predation has also been object of numerous pronouncements of regional and by regional organizations. Besides those of the UN, there are a great number of unanimous pronouncements calling for putting an end to this dispute of sovereignty through negotiation from the organization, and this comes from the Organization of American States, the Rio Group, the Ibero-American Summit, Mercosur, UNASUR, ALADI, the Central American Integration System, the Summit of Latin America and the Caribbean, the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, the Summit of South America and Arab countries, G77 plus China, ALBA, and the list will go on and on and on. There is an overwhelming support for the international, from the international community <clears throat> for both parties to negotiate an end to this dispute and a consistent support of the whole of the countries in the region to the legitimate sovereign rights of Argentina over the islands. Just to quote one of the many, the heads of the state and government of the Ibero-American countries reaffirm the need for the governments of Argentina and the UK to resume negotiations as soon as possible with a view to finding a prompt solution to the sovereignty dispute over the Malvinas, South Georgia, South Sandwich Islands, and the surrounding maritime areas in pursuance of resolutions of the UN and the OAS and the provisions and purposes of Charter of the UN, including the principle of inter uh, territorial integrity. There are quite a few of these. It is not acceptable that a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, which has therefore special responsibilities in the preservation and maintenance of international peace and security, persistently refuse to negotiate a peaceful settlement to a territorial dispute accepted as such by numerous UN resolutions and in which it is a party. This attitude contributes to undermine the UN system and runs contrary to Chapter 6 of the UN Charter on peaceful settlement of disputes. It is not acceptable that a permanent member of the Security Council will consider itself beyond the appeals of the international community, beyond the opinion of the United Nations, and decide to be the only arbitrator as to when and how to negotiate, and even as to whether to do so or not. Furthermore, the United Kingdom has militarized the islands and has brought elements of strategic concerns that they pursue in other parts of the globe to our South American zone of peace. Britain has turned the islands into a fortress, being one of the places on the planet with as many military personnel as inhabitants. The British Strategic Defense and Security Review of 2010 shows the aim is to have a support center for military deployment on a global scale. It is a goal alien to the interests of the region. Argentina does not represent any military threat, as it has voted that all actions pursuant to the recovery of sovereignty over the a Serb island will be exclusive by peaceful means. Even our constitution states that the recovery of these islands must take place through the peaceful means provided by the UN Charter. Argentina, besides, has one of the lowest per capita expenditure indices in, with relation to GDP in the defense in the world. The conduct of military exercises by British forces, which include the firing of missiles from the islands, led Argentina to raise the matter at the International Maritime Organization they have even refused to indicate whether or not they have introduced nuclear weapons into the zone of application of the Tartelolco Treaty, violating not only its norms, but more importantly, the firm desire of all our countries to make Latin America and its waters a zone free of nuclear <coughs> weapons. That military presence in Malvinas, Georgia, and Sandwich and the maritime spaces has been rejected by the heads of the state of UNASUR, and it is considered contrary to the policy of the region to find a solution to the dispute. Argentina has brought these matters to the uh, President of the Security Council and to the Secretary General of the UN. The question of Malvinas is an anachronistic colonial remnant in South America. We should be terminated peacefully. It is a bad ghost of the 19th century hanging over our rights as an independent nation to our territorial integrity. 
It is a situation that cannot continue, must be put to an end through negotiations. Just as the UN Charter and all the specific resolutions adopted by that organization and many others mandate on the matter. Both parties should make use of the mandate that the Secretary General of the UN has been receiving since 1982 to use his good offices in order to assist them both in complying with the request made by the General Assembly in its resolutions on the matter. This is a bilateral territorial dispute between Argentina and the United Kingdom, and not the matter to be decided by a pretended right of self-determination by the population implanted by the colonial power after the expulsion of Argentine settlers in 1833. Self-determination is used here as a tool to keep a military base with the strategic goals and to exploit the natural resources of the territories. As the resolutions of the UN General Assembly, of the Committee on Decolonization, and many other bodies have indicated, the interests and not the wishes of the population of the islands must be taken into account, and the Argentine government and people are ready to do so and to do everything in our means to do just that. We want to reassure the islanders that they, as so many millions of foreigners that came to our shores before them, including many thousand Britons, will be able to continue with their lifestyle and Argentine sovereignty. We do not want them to change or nor represent any risk for their rights and way of living. They will add to the rich tapestry of our multicultural society. In legal terms, they are a population of about 2,000 souls but not a people different from the nationals of the colonial power and therefore cannot enjoy the right of self-determination against the rights of 41 million Argentines to recover their territorial integrity in illegitimately taken by force from us 180 years ago. Latin America does not want nor deserves to be the subject of colonial and foreign occupations. We are already in the second decade of the 21st century and not in the time of colonial empires and of rampant disregard for the rights of weaker countries and their peoples. It is high time for the United Kingdom to come to the negotiating table for the sake of international law, of justice, of peace, and of our peoples, including those living in Malvinas. Argentina is demanding no more nor less than just that, and no peaceful country should refuse to comply with the UN Charter and its purposes and principles. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we have time for questions and discussion from the floor. Well, the, the three things you, you, I think, Sean, unfortunately, you have a, your frame of mind to say, why now? This is not now. That's what the whole point of this. This has been going on for 180 years. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. It's not, the, it may be the first time you heard about it, but it is 180 years that we have been on this matter. So it is not now. And I don't think there is a manipulation of the thing because if this is something that is accepted not just by Argentina, by every, every part in Argentina, the whole of Latin America. And I will go to the, I will go to the comment that you made on the, on the Caribbean, because the Caribbean countries have been consistently joining the resolutions adopted by consensus in the, in the OAS, as you have, Canada, on the matter that the two parties have to sit and negotiate. Many of them voted in favor of the resolutions at the UN. And the other thing is that I quote in the, in, unfortunately it was going very fast, there are this a pronouncement of the, of the meetings between the Latin American and Caribbean countries, the Rio group, and all those, the Caribbean countries, the Commonwealth Caribbean countries are very much in there. Guyana, as you know, is party to the UNASUR as well. And it's this declaration that I read, they have been subscribed by all those. So it's not, it's not a question that these countries are not in uh, demanding that the two parties have to negotiate. The other things that you mentioned, the question of Repsol, this is an exercise of sovereign rights of Argentina to its energy policy, and I don't think anybody will mix the two things. It has nothing to do with Malvinas. Repsol was expropriated two weeks ago. Malvinas has been going on for 180 years, so it's uh, very different. And uh, regarding your comments about how Mercosur, Mercosur is squarely behind Argentina, in not supporting negotiations, in saying that the islands belong to us. So there is no problem with Mercosur in this matter, I can assure you. Well, that's what I said. I mean, this is simply not something that uh, is acceptable. And I don't think a referendum of, of that sort will be just to, what I said, it's just to confirm that they, the islands will remain British because there are British citizens. There, are, there is a British population there implanted over a period of time after there was already a territorial dispute accepted as such. So I think that I have the impression that such a referendum will not be accepted by anyone. 
Certainly, I'm, I can assure you they will not be accepted in Latin America, in the whole of the Americas. That would be an, an, a further act of provocation, obviously, but uh, I don't think it will have any, any effect, certainly not a legal one. It, it, has, a, it has for claimants, for claimants it has on oh, Antarctica, I mean, it has a, an implication that it is because of the, uh, the, the segment, the sectors, where the advice on whatever you are. But I think that's a, something that both parties so far have kept it into the, the realm of the Antarctic Treaty, which both are very committed. And by the way, uh, we cooperate a lot with them. They are the same as Chile and others. It's not, in the Antarctic Treaty, fortunately, it has been kept outside of all these disputes, and I think it's a good thing, a good thing for everyone. Regarding the first question, well, it's, um, you said it, so, and uh, you have also Diego Garcia, where it seems that the, the interest of the guys that were just expelled to, to Mauritius to make a military base was not exactly, the, the, I mean, the self-determination was not paramount there. No, there was a, there was a demand, uh, this is a, because it is a very complex case, it's not just a legal matter. It is a matter that affects also a number of other elements. It's also a political thing. It has a legal <coughs> content to that as well. There was a, 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 um, a Britain tried to bring the matter to the International Court of Justice only regarding South Georgia and Sandwich and Orkney in 1955, and we didn't accept that because it is part of a whole package. Well, that, what I mentioned before, I think it is much more complicated. The first thing we have to do is to sit and negotiate. And from, from the negotiating table, things will come up. We cannot pre preclude from here what to do, what to tell the, whoever will be the negotiators. But uh, in the case of, uh, uh, of uh, Diego Garcia, I understand there is even uh, a, a, a judgment in favor of the return of the islands, which has gone just uh, unheeded. The British court, the free British High Court, said that they should be returned, and it hasn't. And which the government of Britain agreed to disagree? Yeah, to that's right. Well, the, to the first question, there's not for me to say. I mean, that's for we have people from DFAT here, so uh, obviously that is uh, for the Australians to say what is their position on Malvinas. I know what it is, and we are reasonably happy with it. So, but uh, but it's not up to us to to say what is the position of Australia. Regarding the first question, it is a question of negotiating. Again, that's what we are saying. I mean, you cannot find any reasonable solution if we, the parties don't sit and talk. There's no, no way that you will find a reasonable. If you ask my position, what would be a, a reasonable solution is the, the, the islands have to be handed back to us. <laughs> it's as simple as that, <laughs> obviously. And that, that's what it would be, but that's what, that would be the reasonable solution if you ask me and if you ask the Argentine government. But of course, there is. Uh, to let, say the least, a diverging view, which has been going on for 180 years, as I said. So obviously the only way to sort them out is to negotiate. By the way, I, as I mentioned in my expose, it is an obligation of every country, but particularly for those who are sitting as permanent members of the Security Council. They have the obligation to uphold the Charter more than the rest. They have a privilege, and privileges come with responsibilities. Well, it has. I, I read the, one of the paragraphs that I read about UNASUR, and in the, if we go back to the, there you go. All those are pronouncements of UNASUR. And certainly the question of the priority, that goes back to the question uh, put by Sean, this is not a priority now. Now it's a bit noisier, and let's be honest. It is noisier because last year, there was some announcement on defense in the UK, and immediately after there were some ship sailings in, into Argentina. And that, that's what happened, that's the chronology. It's not that Argentina started beating up the drum. So we have to put things in perspective. So um, for us, we have to insist on this, it would always be a priority. There's no question, because you know, this can go on and on and on. We are ready to go for the next 480 years, it may be. I mean, we are going to always be there. We are 400 kilometers away, and the islands are 13,000 kilometers from the UK. So unless the tectonic plates start moving faster, <laughs> we will be there. So it's better to find a solution. Well, I mentioned that Malvina is one of the things that the, what it happens when it was uh, occupied is that there is an amputation of the sovereign uh, territory. We are an uncompleted country, if you like, 
It would be like if you take Tasmania out of, the, of Australia and somebody else would be there. And obviously, it is a very, very uh, important thing. I mentioned when I said that it, they have to be returned to its rightful sovereign, I mentioned the Argentine people when I said that, not the Argentine governments or the Argentine state. It is a very dear thing for all Argentines, and I would say for, for many Latin Americans as, uh, also. It's not just a question for us, but it is very much for us. It is very important, and that's why what I mentioned before, we can wait 480 years. It's not a question that we will just go away just if you keep ignoring these noisy urges with the things will fade away. It won't. Well, precisely one thing that um, uh, I would say is that uh, the expression absorption is something we don't want to, to use because that would not happen. I mean, many of those people that you mentioned that uh, from British origin, even coming from Malvinas, that populated uh, southern Argentina, so in Patagonia, they have never been absorbed in the sense that they have been impeded to be as British as they were before. I mean, by the way, when I was in, in London as Consul General, as he mentioned in my CV, uh, Radio Wales in Cardiff, they brought people from Chubut to be, um, to be the, how do you say, locutors, to be speaking on the radio because they had a Welsh which was not tainted with English. So they, so much they conserved their own, their own Welshness, if you like. So of course we don't want to, I, I, it is true that they would be more than welcome and certainly as part of the negotiations that may ensue, we will guarantee whatever kind of, uh, of uh, specific things they need because obviously there will be a population that will be a special, very small as you said, because in fact the other problem that Malvinas is experiencing with the, with the original population is they're bringing people from, from elsewhere. I mean there are quite a few people from, from St. Helena, there are I think 300 Chileans even now in, in Malvinas. So the, the, the actual population of the islands and the ones that born and, and raised or whatever, they are very, very few and becoming fewer. And not surprising, I mean, they are, even if they are prosperous, they live in a sort of a military base. That's what it is. That's what it has become. Well, yeah. Uh, Malvinas comes with a huge continental shelf and, uh, and the big EZ. So obviously, it is, it is something that, which I think, I, everybody thinks, it's one of the reasons why this uh, special love for the self-determination of the islanders is, uh, that I, that's why I mentioned that there, there is an intent, an economic intent, obviously the islands are both strategically, again, they consider somehow important, and that's why we in Latin America, we have a zone of peace, the relationship between the, the Latin American countries is, a, is, is excellent. With the last thing we want is to have a, a sort of a, an a strategic base which we'll be looking at global problems, global uh, problems in the world in that area, and economically it is a very rich area. There's no question about it. Well, I'm not, I'm not an expert in the Monroe Doctrine, but certainly that is 1823. And uh, uh, the United States, as far as I recall, they have always said that it was a policy doctrine, not a legal thing. However, it is clear that at that time, in fact, the Monroe Doctrine was more than with the, with the British, because the British, they went to war in 1812. And then from then on, relations were not that bad. In fact, the Monroe Doctrine was because there was some countries, Russia in particular, trying to establish uh, um, bases in the west coast of, uh, of, uh, of the Northern North America. Remember that by that time, Alaska was theirs. So, uh, and that was the, the essential thing. But it, what it proves, the Monroe Doctrine, even if it is not a, a, a legal doctrine, it is that uh, already in 1823, all the Latin American countries, because what I mentioned that came to independence with the Uti Posidetis, uh, even that applies to Brazil as well, of course, because they got the independence in 1822, is it in Ruben? Uh, so, but even at that time, it was clear that the United States politically will not accept new acquisitions of territory by force. That's the clear thing. So that's, that we never use that because we don't go into the, the interpretations that the Americans will do of their own doctrine. That's clear, but it was not accepted. Even conquest as such for territory was already not accepted in the Americas. It was accepted somewhere else, but not in the Americas, even at the beginning of the 19th century. 
Regarding the Rio Treaty, the TR, the one that uh, you mentioned, well, it didn't work. It was a, it was a treaty that in the in Malvinas was uh, um, we called the the consultation body of the OAS at that time. There was no, as we know, uh, in the war there was no military help provided for Argentina as such, even though we had the solidarity of the Latin American countries, a few sent us some material, but there was not any, it was, there was no any, any force. However, in the OAS, the consultation body, during, we're talking here within, at the time of the conflict going on, 28th of April, 1982, it says to urge the government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, this is in the consultation body of the Rio Treaty happens at the OAS, to urge the government of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland immediately to cease hostilities. It is carrying on within the security region defined by Article 4 of the Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance and also to refrain from any act that may affect Inter-American peace and security. It didn't have any practical effect because, as we know, the United States in the war sided with Britain. But that was the response to the Rio Treaty at that time. I have the impression that the relations between Latin American countries and the Arab countries has always been very good. Certainly the, the, the spring revolution, or as it's called, will further that because there will be some uh, elements also in which there will be elements in common, but it has always been very good. And I just mentioned in the list of the, of the pronouncement in favor of the, of the a negotiated solution for this, I mentioned precisely the summit of the Latin American and Arab countries. So it is, and most of the Arab countries, in fact, supported the resolutions of the UN on Malvinas. We've counted, in, I mean, the Arab bloc is not a single bloc, of course. There are different countries, but most of them supported this, the, the need for negotiations. And, uh, and we get very along very well. In fact, in Argentina, there are about a million uh, descendants of uh, people of Arab origin, more than a million. And in Brazil, there are many more. So all the Latin American countries have lots of people from Arab origin living there. So, and uh, you are living proof that uh, we don't absorb people, we just welcome them. And they become the same as us and they can keep their own tradition. I actually went to the University of Tucumán and I studied- oh, Well, I'm Tucumán, so, oh, 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 sorry, no, then, then we're brothers already. It's, uh, I mean, we have uh, gone from the stage of cousinness to brotherhood. <laughs> Well, I didn't say that we favor resolution with the islanders. I said that we favor resolution between Argentina and the United Kingdom. The islanders, I presume, will be part of the package with the United Kingdom. We are calling precisely that the negotiations are we, the United Nations, uh, all the other bodies, and say that the negotiations, this is a bilateral territorial dispute in which the interests of the islands will be taken into account. But we are not saying that we are going to negotiate directly with the islanders, first thing. Secondly, this thing of being isolated is not that we are isolating the islanders. We have not been allowed, as I mentioned, to ever go to the islands. The Argentines, we cannot live there, we cannot acquire property, we cannot uh, go even with a, with a normal passport. For many years we were even stopped from the, the, um, the relatives of the, of the fallen in Malvinas to go and visit their graves, for many years. So the thing that has been done now is not just, of course we are not going to favor the possibility of the islanders or of Britain exploiting unilaterally the natural resources, the non-renewable resources of the islands. And the decision that was taken, not by Argentina, by the whole of Mercosur, of not allowing ships f with the flag flying the, the island's flag, because it is not a legal entity. It is not a separate legal entity. However, all these things, again, could be part of the negotiation when the UK decides to sit and start talking as it is its obligation under the UN Charter. No, there hasn't been any advisory opinion, and uh, that's uh, coming back a bit to the thing of the ICJ. Obviously, that for, to do any of these things, we'll need to go to, to, the, to negotiation by the parties, but I presume that uh, more than an, an advisory opinion, the ICJ, if anything has to be done in the ICJ, which we are, we are not supporting at this stage at least, is to go to the ICJ to decide. I mean, there, there will be any, any case of saying, well, 
an advisory opinion will just be probably helping the negotiations, which are the ones that have to take place in, at the beginning. Coming to the UN, I, I, we don't think that the UN uh, can only provide a moral thing. The UN is the framework for this. And certainly it is there which it has been framed. The whole, the whole controversy, the whole dispute has been framed at the UN, and there is a mandate for the uh, UN Secretary General to use its good offices to bring the parties together that we have been uh, calling on the, on the, on the Secretary General re very recently, the last time by our, our um, foreign minister. I think that the role that the UN can play in this is fundamental, as it has, because all these declarations put in the, the, the legal uh, framework in which the, the dispute has to be solved comes from the UN, and we are very much for it. In fact, the, the first mandate for the Secretary General to use his good offices came during the conflict in 1982. There were some, in the previous resolutions adopted by the UN General Assembly, there were, of course, a mandate for the, gen, for the Secretary General to prepare reports. But in the Security Council during the conflict, there was a mandate which is still standing for the Secretary General to use his good offices to bring the parties together. We are ready to do that any time. I'd like to thank the Ambassador for a marvellous presentation, I think an encyclopedic knowledge of the situation <laughs> over centuries. And, uh, and it lasted for, for centuries, the speech as well. <laughs> <laughs> And for, and for being very brief in presenting that, <laughs> that uh, exposition as well. And I'd like to thank all of you. I'd particularly like to thank the diplomatic representatives. Uh, there are numerous ambassadors here who I know, and I'm sure some who I don't. Uh, but thank you very much for coming. Also, for other diplomatic representatives and representatives from the Australian diplomatic and uh, community as well. Uh, now we have the opportunity for a less formal discussion in the foyer uh, and for refreshments provided by the Embassy of Argentina. Argentine wine? Argentine, Argentine wine, Argentine, Argentine food Argentine with, Argentine uh, with, uh, with uh, Australian ingredients. Australian. Uh, no, no, we, we serve in these kind of things where we want to promote our case, we serve good wine, Argentine wine. Argentine. <laughs> <laughs> but before, before you do that, uh, this, is, this is the exercise of yeah, Ar no, Argentine of soft power, I think. Uh, the export of wine. Let me advertise the next event that we have. And I said at the beginning that we have uh, a wide variety of things that we present here at Anklas. I think it would be harder to imagine a greater contrast uh, from this with our next event. The next event will be a, a cultural event and it will be a presentation, a performance by Mariana Gonzalez from Paraguay of the harp of Paraguay. Uh, it may come as a surprise to some people, it certainly came as a surprise to me, I must admit, that the national instrument of Paraguay is the harp. And we have a, an international performer who will be performing at University House, the Great Hall at University House, next Tuesday evening at 6.30. But for that, unusually, you do have to RSVP because of space considerations and so on. But please, if you can, be our guest next Tuesday night. And also stay in touch with Anklas through the email list and so on. But finally, once again, could you please thank the Ambassador of Argentina for their Thank you. Thanks very much, Anklas, for this opportunity.